presentation. Yeah, on the presentation and uh, mm. on the PDF. I guess, but, uh, this one? Yeah, the, the, no, 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 on the PDF. This one too. Is it working? Yeah. Wow. This is great. Hello, everyone. Um, my name is Sergei Borotka. I'm from uh, Belarusian State University in Minsk, Belarus, and more specifically, the National Zone Monitoring Research and Education Center. It is uh, research, one of the research centers of the university. And I'm going to um, tell a bit about uh, one of our ongoing uh, topics of research, which is related to um, analysis and modeling for zone anomalies, uh, uh, but actually uh, this is uh, maybe not the primary, so our primary area of research of, uh, in our research center is developing uh, actually instrumentations for ozone measurements, which is m um, mainly optical passive remote sensing. Uh, so this is the instrument, uh, more instrument uh, uh, hardware oriented part of um, our research center, but uh, another part which I belong to uh, uh, is doing analysis and numerical modeling in the last years as well. Uh, so uh, um, actually, yeah, we uh, do something related to stratosphere troposphere interactions and ozone climate connections in this. Uh, um, this has started maybe uh, 20 years ago. I mean, uh, the center was founded, uh, and uh, we have, uh, from this theoretical analysis point of view, have analyzed uh, some uh, things like uh, ozone trends, uh, connections between ozone and uh, atmospheric general circulation, and uh, like you can see, uh, analyzing, uh, comparing um, a number of days from the observational analysis and comparing them to certain types of circulation. This was mainly analysis of observational data. And uh, during the years, uh, one interesting task pointed out, which was related to, is there a way to develop a way of forecasting uh, total ozone content uh, in a very short term? Uh, on the basis of the meteorological information uh, that you can have. Uh, so, and uh, one of the basis for that was uh, one of the results which was related uh, to statistical analysis between the uh, daily measurements of total ozone content over the given point and to the uh, surface temperature. So after a number of um, analysis techniques, uh, it has been found that uh, you, you can find a, a very beautiful correlation between the total ozone content over the given point and uh, say if it is your station ob observations over the given city and the surface temperature, but it works only for the extended summer period. And uh, also you have to do some uh, averaging of the parameters. It should be not instantaneous, like, uh, but a very small, like uh, two, three or four days. Averaging gives you a time series that can provide you with such a nice correlation. So uh, it can be given some interpretation in terms of uh, atmospheric uh, atmospheric masses uh, changing over the given point. But anyway, it works uh, in s only in the extended summer period in, in our region, in mid-latitudes, and uh, it was used as a base for a statistical forecasting techniques for the total ozone content for, like, uh, for the next day, for, for the next uh, few days. Uh, but uh, there is one important exception uh, where uh, it is more difficult to use such techniques, uh, and in, uh, it is this uh, not very, you know, not very numerous cases no, uh, or numerous days when you have such event as a local ozone anomaly, so uh, which makes the forecasting much more different. Uh, actually, we can uh, say a few words in, in more general perspectives that uh, just as everybody knows from textbooks that we are now speaking about uh, the stratospheric ozone or the near surface tropospheric ozone layer, and you, uh, you know that it is uh, main. Um, components of the atmosphere responsible for the unique temperature profile for the very existence of the stratosphere. And it's, uh, so it's just a very schematic description of the vertical distribution of ozone in the atmosphere. Uh, and uh, uh, 
we can expect that it will be dependent on the processes in the troposphere, that the ozone distribution in the stratosphere will be dependent on tropospheric weather phenomena, and vice versa, that we can even expect that uh, there should be uh, a possible influence on the tropospheric weather and climate, on the circulation on large and small scales, depending on the processes in the ozone layer. So uh, it is a very interesting area of research uh, regarding the question which are the predominant directions of interactions and how, uh, how strong they are. Um, while uh, we can say that we can imagine uh, changes in the stratospheric ozone distribution coming from the surface weather, on the other hand, uh, if we, um, we, we can point a number of different reasons which may cause uh, variability in the ozone, which are not related to the troposphere, so we can uh, have changes in the stratospheric ozone due to other regions and then uh, point out if you have uh, some change, some effects from then in the surface weather and climate. So that's so such obvious. Uh, the most popular, uh, maybe the most popular issue is uh, like influence of solar activity on the ozone and then the propagation of the signal down to the lower stratosphere and the troposphere. Uh, in fact, the, the system is uh, endlessly complicated and. Uh, more specifically uh, for the topic of this workshop, we can uh, we know that uh, we can also speak about the role of the stratospheric and stratospheric ozone, of course, uh, in connection with the uh, El Nino southern installation and other uh, seasonal scale processes in the related to stratospheric weather and climate. Yeah, but here we can just say that a lot of uh, external uh, f uh, things can be sources of the variability in the str stratosphere. And so uh, another interesting point of, uh, another interesting area of research is trying to find the um, top-down propagation and the top-down um, site of this stratosphere-troposphere interaction, some of the ozone influence on uh, tropospheric weather and climate. Mm, this is also what uh, we, we have been doing for some time, and uh, our approach included uh, analysis of correlations between the changes in the stratospheric ozone distribution, which can be uh, due to some external reasons not related to tropospheric phenomena, like uh, what we mentioned above, like uh, solar uh, processes, uh, energetic particle precipitations, like that. And uh, we can analyze the relations between it and between large-scale features of the tropospheric circulations, which can, we can analyze by uh, such, uh, you know, such features as uh, stationary upper layer frontal zones, or the boundaries of the uh, tropospheric AMSs. Uh, so this is uh, a way of analyzing the interaction of, of this kind. But uh, the other side of uh, this study, the other side of the kind of troposphere, troposphere interactions, is related to uh, smaller scales, and uh, this is what I'm going to focus now on. Uh, this is such uh, event, such phenomenon as local ozone anomalies, uh, which we may uh, expect to be more like the down top side of interaction. This is we may expect that this to be a result of the influence of surface weather on the stratospheric ozone distribution, and we, we shall now see why. So, because they are universally recognized to be formations of a predominantly dynamical origin. Why? Because mainly of, you see, as, uh, synop they have synoptic scale um, in the both space and time, and since they are synoptic scale deviations, we may expect that they uh, should be related uh, purely to the dynamical processes uh, in the troposphere and the, in the troposphere, upper troposphere, lower stratosphere region. And they are occasionally named mini holes for the negative and mini highs positive, so, but we should uh, know that uh, they are holes, but they are not this hole, uh, actually, which is a very known, maybe the hole, I use the capital H for it, because it is the seasonal, the true ozone hole that is, has forming, is a, uh, in above Antarctica every polar winter, and uh, we know that it is due to chemical processes, and uh, we can speak about uh, the importance of, in fact, of studies of the influence of uh, this large ozone skull on the tropospheric circulation on the surface weather. And uh, what we are talking about is not even this one, because this, is not a, this was not above Antarctica, uh, but you remember that uh, through um, the same, the same uh, of the, uh, an 
ozone hole of the same size, approximately just as large as above Antarctica that we had uh, above the, in the northern hemisphere in 2011. This was also due to chemical ozone destruction. It was also on the seasonal type scale related to large polar vortex, ozone, uh, chemical ozone de depletion. And an interesting thing is that uh, actually in both cases we had uh, uh, an important influence of ozone depletion on surface, on the tropospheric circulation and on surface weather. We can name at least a few publications that analyze that when we're speaking about the and classical, the Antarctic ozone hole. Uh, you can just mention a few modeling studies and analysis studies that analyze how does this um, ozone depletion uh, influence the circulation and has, prof uh, has effects not just over Antarctica but over other regions like you see subtropical precipitation patterns. But it's not just the Antarctic ozone hole because the Arctic uh, record animal in 2011 and also uh, regular lowering of the ozone content of Arctic, which are not as large as it was in 2011, but uh, nevertheless, uh, we know there is a lot of research uh, relating to that and to in its influence on the circulation and its re relation to the El Nino events. And uh, also, in fact, uh, in the general, it is a very important side of the atmospheric processes, that especially for the seasonal forecast, and which is the topic of this meeting and in fact it is uh, one of the um, important factors that are to be accounted in the model for seasonal forecast and especially the interaction between the uh, circulation ozone redistribution and uh, its radiative heating so uh, what are we calling ozone mini holes ozone animals are events like that uh, this is so uh, kind of old this is december 1997 january 1998 it was yeah it is a synoptic time, time scale but it just happened so that it was exactly on the new year day and uh, actually i like this case very much because uh, e we are speaking about this mini hole anomaly i like this case very much because it happened above uh, my country it's, it's uh, passed through central europe and eastern europe and finally passed belarus and uh, several other countries uh, in eastern europe and uh, in fact it is uh, the recordly low event uh, because it is responsible for the um, very low total ozone values like 163 drops and units it is comparable to that in the antarctic i guess in the antarctic ozone hole anyway it is very low for europe and what we can see is that, that this is uh, one of the um, form, uh, kind of maps that are very um, often used when looking for ozone distribution. So this is obviously from the uh, very well-known and used Canadian uh, Environment Canada webpage. So we can see, we are looking for total ozone now. We see that at the same moment we have, uh, this is a typical distribution, uh, if not the fact that we have such a small um, amount of ozone here, such a profound ozone minima. So we have both ozone maximum and minima, and it is, in fact, just a dynamical distribution of ozone without uh, any chemical depletion. But anyway, it is still ozone hole, and it still leads to uh, high ultraviolet exposure values, uh, but only for a few days when it takes place. It can be more obvious to look at it on the deviation uh, map where we see deviations of the total ozone from its so-called normal values and uh, this is probably which is more often used than the total ozone maps. But here uh, one question that we may think of is uh, what should be used as a normal distribution of ozone just for this calculation and it de actually depends on uh, who is doing this. So, so in different places we may find the, that uh, different uh, climatologies, different distributions of ozones, uh, of uh, like different normal distributions of ozones are used, but, uh, are used, but uh, in fact what we have in the end uh, uh, depends on that. Because in this case, obviously we can see the ozone anomaly both in the total ozone fields and in the deviations for, uh, from the so-called normal distribution. But uh, in uh, not all cases are like that. You see that we can, uh, we can maybe speak about some other not so profound animals just here. Uh, but it, uh, it becomes important when we try to make some kind of statistic and, uh, or climatology of local ozone animals 
and uh, in this case, uh, the results will be dependent on, on what is used as a normal distribution. So, and uh, we have actually uh, tried to make such kind of analysis and uh, uh, to go from the case by case analysis, which is uh, uh, like when you see, uh, when you are looking for papers uh, studying local ozone MLS, it normally analyzes uh, like one or two uh, cases, and uh, they, it is not always easy to just have a like a database of all, say, local ozone animals over Europe for a given time period. And so it should be uh, more logically done with uh, something like objective feature extraction. So we would like to have an objective identification and tracking algorithm for all local ozone animals and then apply it to some uh, for analysis or analysis fields. Uh, it's, uh, we can use similar ideas like uh, used in other uh, papers related to the general fields of application of objective feature identification algorithms for geoscientific data sets. Uh, but the point is that different definitions of locals and animals exist. So uh, what we are going to use is just a simple definition as a deviation of the, in the total ozone field from some uh, specified uh, normal distribution, which is greater than some threshold value. And also, we need it to be a contiguous region on the map, and also we'd like consecutive time steps of the anomaly to overlap, and so it would be, a con in fact, a continuous region of uh, more than threshold of deviation that is above this thresh threshold value, which is uh, a continuous region in the three-dimensional space, like latitude, longitude, and time. And also, we need to do some subsequent filtering to filter out animals that are just not true animals, but something, some spurious things. And we can start using just reanalysis data, reentering for the extended time period and MACC for the shorter one. And uh, actually, we'd, we'd like to compare two ways of uh, specifying the climatology of the ozone. And uh, we're taking 20% deviation for grids points area uh, corrected for the latitude, cosine of latitude, and the minimal duration of 24 hours. And so uh, smaller animals will be filtered out. And what we get, oh, we are looking only for the European region, and uh, what we actually get is some kind of uh, statistic of special distribution of animalies. Uh, it is not like how many days with the animal above it, but it's actually the number of events. So it means that this, in this region we had about uh, 200 and something events of locals and animalies, more or less pronounced over the over the period so uh, another we can obviously see that uh, they are uh, practically very low animals according to the above mentioned definition in uh, lower latitudes and also that we have this area which is uh, can be explained by uh, that this type of uh, temporal variability in the zone field is more is more pronounced here in non north atlantic uh, this yeah this was negative animals and these are the positive ones and we can compare it with uh, diff uh, what we get if we are using a different definition for the climatol for the normal distribution of a zone. So, and uh, the results are somewhat different, and uh, also the distribution will be looking a bit different when we are using uh, an extended distribution, uh, a more, a larger, um, I mean, a longer time period from 1991, but it is similar to MACC with the same definition of climatological. Uh, norm of ozone. Uh, and another thing is uh, that we can uh, analyze just uh, briefly the temporal distribution and in fact this is what one should expect that we have much more local ozone animals in winter time than in summer. And it comes actually both to negative and positive animals so there are virtually no such events in summer and probably what I mentioned before that the statistical forecasting techniques for the total ozone works well only in the uh, extended summer period, so we can relate this to that as well. Mm, it's a bit different for the different definition, but uh, actually coming uh, back to the specified case, uh, we can see it's uh, a very, uh, the white actually is lower than 200 Dobson units. Well, so it's uh, really the lowest uh, animal ever recorded uh, over Belarus and uh, I guess over Poland, over neighboring countries. Uh, even by ground-based instrumentation. So if you look at the reanalysis, it is, shows the development of the anomaly over several days. And what we are trying to do is uh, uh, check 
how easy it is to reproduce the ozone anomaly in a general circulation model. Uh, because, it, yeah, we, as we will see, it is more difficult than uh, reproducing surface weather. So the, the quality, the outcome will be much more different for the ozone than for the surface weather. So we can uh, see that just for this case, uh, if you are using at least the T 255 resolution, uh, we can indeed reproduce the, and we actually tried using different initial dates, but uh, this is like well, five to seven days ahead of the anomaly minima. Uh, we indeed have some anomaly this is formed by in the last time moment. Uh, we don't have it in the model just for this case. Uh, so it either disappears or moves some different direction. And if we compare the two cycles of OpenIFS, uh, we, have, we can see a small difference. And uh, maybe the cycle 40 is uh, more pronounced on the last time step on the model. What, what, which is, what is actually of, uh, most interesting for me is the role of the um, dynamical ozone in the radiation scheme. And actually on these time scales, as probably one should expect, we uh, can see only minimal differences between the ozone taken from climatology to the radiation scheme and prognostic ozone taken to the radiation scheme. But uh, it is not always the same. So on this, we can see more difference on the, just on the next time step. So there is indeed some difference, but uh, it is uh, just maybe as small as one should expect on this kind of short synoptic time scales. But uh, I'm about to finish, but I um, would like to show just another case of anomaly. It is a local ozone anomaly over mainly over the UK and uh, some other parts of Europe in March 2005. It is an example of a springtime anomaly, and uh, it is peculiar that this one got simulated well as compared to the previous one. Maybe this is because of a better representation of ozone for these years in the initial data. Yeah, we can see it developing in the reanalysis and also, uh, so yeah, the, the minimum was uh, above the UK exactly, so it's kind of an interesting case. And uh, there is some difference between the cycles of the model, but not that much. And uh, there it is, uh, in principle, it is reproduced well in both model cases, uh, model cycles, and uh, also in this case, both with the climatological and the prognostic ozone, the result is almost the same. And Mm, it is um, much more similar to the analysis than the, those 1997-1998 case. Okay, thank you.